This is a kind of book review of The Network State, which is a really creative economic and governance vision of the future. And the book is so full of political theory and historical theory and game theory of sorts. So I'm certainly not going to cover all of it by any means. But my hope here is to lay out some stuff that we can build from if we believe, as I do, that we need to be building a new economic vision of the future. His basic idea is to have startup societies that are a little bit like a startup business, except it's more oriented toward governance, where when these startup societies uh, balloon into bigger network states, it's Instead of this being like um, a small startup ballooning into something like Amazon or a small startup ballooning into something like Facebook or whatnot, it's going to be a small startup that balloons into essentially a new online governance system. And he lays out several features of the eventual network states, which are kind of a vision of what these look like after they have grown big. And I'm going to cluster these under the category of governance and economics. So first, each of these network states has their own cryptocurrency and crypto economy. Second, there's going to be free entry and exit from these network states. Third, under the economic realm, is that these network states are going to be able to crowdfund physical space, like buildings and lands, as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then under the governance realm, first we're going to have on-chain governance within one of these network states, which is basically like analogous to the electoral system, the voting system in the US, except they can use more creative types of governance. And then under governance, there's going to be capacity for collective action. So capacity for people in this network state to come together and use their collective power of some kind to negotiate their needs with the population outside of that network state. And then of course, free entry and exit is going to be super relevant in the governance realm as well as the economic realm. And then finally, he's envisioning some of these network states getting so big and crowdfunding enough physical land and physical space that they're actually recognized by other governments. Diplomatic recognition is what he calls that. Now, of course, on my channel, I have this third realm, the sense-making or the epistemic realm, which he doesn't really talk about in this book, but he also acknowledges that the book is basically a first draft that's alive that he may be adding to over the years. So I don't think this is necessarily because he doesn't think it's important. And I think his vision is very in touch with this particular moment in the digital age, in the social sociopolitical age because he recognizes that there are a lot of changes that are happening very quickly in many realms and that there's likely going to be a shift in power due to all of these changes. So he's basically saying, okay, we as the population with hopefully at least some collective action power in the world would like to have our place like at the very least, we would like some sort of democratic accountability to whatever power ends up on the top in this reshuffling and this uh, among all these changes that are happening with artificial intelligence and digital spaces. He recognizes there's an importance to that in experimenting with governance. And he says basically experimental macroeconomics, where each of these network states can kind of develop their own macroeconomy, they can set their own rules for how to, how to monitor money, how to control money or not. And in the experimental stage, there's organic growth in these communities where they're testing out different clusters of contracts and governing mechanisms. And he kind of recognizes that a lot of these huge platforms like Amazon and Apple and Google and whatnot, they're basically acting like mini governments where they set the rules, they legislate the rules, and the economic actors or the social actors who come into their spaces are kind of under this mini constitution that's run by a private firm. So he says, okay, why don't we sort of ramp that up and add a democratic element to that that allows people, uh, or that gives people inside this network the power to negotiate collectively for their needs. I also really appreciate how in touch he is with some of these game theory forces at play. 
Like one of the things he talks about a lot is the flippening is what he's calling it. And he talks about this a little bit more in the sort of historical political economy a way where there's a revolutionary class and there's a conservative class. The conservatives want to keep things the way they are. The revolutionaries are in touch with the flaws of the conservative class and they aim to sort of overthrow the conservative class. And eventually the dynamics are such that the revolutionaries win and take power themselves. And eventually that means they're going to become the, the established conservative class. Even if they have sort of a, uh, a founding story where they're the revolutionaries, even if they use the language of revolutionaries, once they actually have power for a while, they in fact are the conservatives. Like he has a section titled, the left is the new right is the new left, that has to do with these flippings. And the, the section titles in and of themselves are, are brilliant. Like if you don't have time to read the book, I highly recommend just going through and reading the section titles because at least you'll get a little bit of a sense of the scope of what he's talking about. But regarding this flippening, I think that happens not just at this macro level with society-wide revolutions, but it kind of happens on the micro level as well in many contexts. And if you're trying to develop a vision of the future, a new vision, one of the big pitfalls is utopianism, where you start to envision a future where human beings are not human beings. They're these angels who are like highly enlightened and it's this utopia that would never work in reality. Like I think that's something that anyone coming up with a creative economic vision needs to watch out for. And the fact that he's in touch with the flippening, like the natural power dynamics that flip over and over between people, means he's building that into his vision of the future, accounting for the fact that this will continue to happen. There is no end of history here. And I mean, this arises because of the power paradox, where um, when you're rising in a system, when you're a new startup that's trying to gain traction, you have to be super sensitive to the needs of the customers. But then once you've gotten power um, as, a, as a company, you don't have to be quite as sensitive. You can actually impose your will and ignore some of the um, demands of the, the customer. And that paradox of power is at play inside companies, inside countries, inside many organizations. And if you don't design a system that is that works well with that natural dynamic, then it's just not going to function or it's going to slip into being a utopian system of the future. I also think he has a really important insight regarding the, the way the nature of power is changing in this economy. And let me give you two of his section titles to go over this. One is the network is the new Leviathan. And the other is the state is still a Leviathan. So basically, Leviathan, um, it comes from Hobbes. Hobbes basically said the government has a monopoly on violence, meaning it can throw people in jail or impose other violent punishments to enforce its will as it tries to create a community that everyone wants to live in. And um, when he says the network is the new Leviathan, it is pointing toward these social credit systems where the punishment, instead of being jail time or a huge fine imposed by the government, the punishment is that you're kicked out of these uh, spaces, these digital spaces. Like you can't sell your product on Amazon if you're disobedient, or you're kicked out of the social platforms if you're disobedient, or you can't um, purchase insurance or purchase uh, train tickets if you are um, disobedient according to the rules set out for society. So it's this really powerful new mechanism of enforcement that certainly didn't exist before the internet came onto being. And he's basically saying, okay, given that dynamic, these network states could actually develop their own constitutions and their own ways of using this Leviathan power according to their own values. 
Now, of course, this is going to raise a whole bunch of questions in terms of the justice and the human rights associated with this. But ideally, these network states would have ways of protecting human rights and ways of protecting liberal democratic values built into them. And there's so much more in this book that I'm not going to go into. I mean, he goes really deep into what is a nation, what is a state, uh, how does history and political theory and all of this play into this current uh, digitally dominated moment. It, it's, it's so deep. But let me get to my criticisms because this is where I'm building off from in coming up with a, a different vision for the future. And I am going to critique um, some of his ideas here, but this isn't a tearing down kind of critique. It's really a building up kind of critique. It's basically saying, okay, if we're going to have a creative vision of the future, what we actually need is different people who think differently, each building out their own vision of what that would look like and borrowing from each other, exchanging from each other, but giving each other space to actually make that vision their own. And I would like to build my own economic vision of the future. So my critiques here are really, okay, if I'm going to use some of the raw materials that he sets out to, uh, to pull from and raw materials from other creative thinkers about the, the future like Oren Kass, then um, I would like to pull those and sort of fill in what I see to be the biggest gaps in his vision of the future. My number one criticism here is that he doesn't really wrestle with the fact that digital communities are extremely ephemeral. Like, they tend to come and go quickly. You don't tend to get real commitment, or at least not the same level of commitment that you have to a, to a workplace community or a, you know, physical, real-world, in-person community. And when you pair that with his free entry and free exit, I think um, a system like this could fail to gain traction, mainly because people don't commit at high levels to online communities. And yes, part of his vision is to eventually crowdsource space in the physical world, but to some degree you have to reach a certain size or reach a certain amount of power and influence before you can make that happen. So I think that would be a huge detriment in getting these things going to begin with. But also, I think the physical communities that exist have a lot more power in sort of shaping human values, shaping human relationships. And so a successful version of an economic future, I think is going to need to have a strong structure for both elements, both the online digital element of the, the, the economy and the governance space, but also spaces where people can build physical in-person communities that support each other in physical ways and that sort of can learn to know and understand each other in a physical space. I think there's something inherently different about sense making and conversation and relationship building in the physical space that you don't get in the digital space. And then my second critique here has to do with selection and this is very much related to adverse selection in economics which is a lot of times the success of a community depends on who selects into it. And the problem here is that if you get really rich people who have a lot of money to invest in a community, to select into a community, and if you keep out people who are struggling or people with various vulnerabilities, that community may have a lot more power, more bargaining power, more leverage and collective action. There may be all kinds of advantages in attracting uh, wealthy people and keeping out vulnerable people. And it's the same problem with health insurance, like adverse selection in health insurance basically says really sick people are super expensive. So if you create a high quality health insurance plan, it will attract the, it'll attract the people who are expensive, which will drive up the price. And people who are healthy are attracted to the low quality, super low price health insurance. And that, that doesn't work well in a market. But I think some of those same dynamics might be at play here, where some problems, it's like if the governance does a great job of solving this problem, then the people attracted to that 
online government are going to be people who have that problem. And when you attract people who have a problem, that, that changes the community and makes it harder to govern. I mean, there's all kinds of issues relating to selection that I think, um, I think would make this system vulnerable in ways he hasn't yet built into his thinking. My third critique here has to do with the initial phase that he's envisioning for these startup communities where he has two features of these that I think um, may not work in the long run. Where one is um, the communities as startups only have one goal. And he gives a bunch of examples, like maybe it's a keto community that supports the key keto lifestyle, which is a um, mostly eat meat protein sort of lifestyle. That's one example. Another example is a traditional religious community. Another is the cancel proof society where you're trying to develop mechanisms that protect people from being canceled online. Another of his examples is the digital Sabbath community that tries to promote not getting too addicted to your smartphone and having time and space offline where you're developing community. So those are his examples. And I did notice that a lot of those examples kind of sound like Reddit communities. Well, if we look at Reddit, those communities, I think, tend to rise and fall, and people tend to ebb and flow in and out of those. Like, people will be really into keto for a few months or maybe a few years, but that's not like the central feature of their lives. So that adds to this ephemeral nature of the communities. But really my bigger critique here is that when it comes to governance, you kind of need a, a bunch of rules that complement each other and fill in each other's gaps. Like if you try to boil the essence of a community down to one particular value or one particular rule, you're not going to have a balanced governance system. So ultimately, I mean, I think he does envision you add on rules as you go, but I think that muddies the waters in terms of, um, in terms of what people are signing up for, because ultimately you need to sign up for an entire governance system, maybe not with everything, like maybe you sign up for it as an experiment and you know it's going to be tweaked and changed a little bit. But you need to sign up for the essence of the governance system and the essence of the way economies are structured within that governance system, rather than some little value that people generally hold for a short period in their lives. And then my next critique is that free entry and exit is not as stable as you might think. And the basic idea here is if you have a government, you need to be able to enforce contracts. Like you need to be able to say, okay, if you two agree to something, we're going to punish you if you don't agree. And if you can get out of that punishment by just leaving the community, then that, that may not be strong enough as an incentive to enforce contracts. And then on the other hand, if anytime this happens, you have members leaving the community over little disputes, that will create more instability in the community. So, I mean, you can see one of my meta critiques here is basically there isn't enough for these kinds of network states to be fully stable as I see it. My fifth critique is that if you're going to have a system like this, it will depend on enforcement from the actual government in that, in that state or in that uh, country. And I mean, I think he kind of knows this, like if you're going to have a free entry and free exit system, you need a government to enforce that. Like what if, you know, what if one of these network states comes up with ways of disallowing people from leaving the state? And maybe that would even be a good feature, I don't know, but um, you need the meta structure that these network states exist in to be governed by someone, and that's likely going to be national governments like the US government. And so he would need some kind of um, strategy for getting governments on board with this kind of thing. And then the last critique for today is just that I think a lot of good governance and good economic systems depend on the information environment.
Like we live in an information economy. And as such, we need stronger mechanisms of determining valid and invalid information, what is a proper sense-making mechanism within the system. And he doesn't really go there. And of course, I mentioned this earlier. Basically, I think we need all three, economics, governance, epistemics, if we're going to make something work. So I think his system needs to be built out in the, in the epistemic realm.